Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. And uh, although this uh, episode is technically uh, an episode in my um, uh, independent bookstores of San Diego series, well, I mean, it is entry in that series, but it's also a lot more than that. Uh, uh, like the previous one in lookbooks, it could also belong just in the regular uh, section on interviews with interesting people. Um, since this one is about uh, the Eternal Return Bookshop in San Diego, uh, which is an antiquarian uh, philosophical bookshop and de book or devoted to uh, rare editions of works of philosophy. And so the, uh, um, uh, the uh, owner and I, uh, Jeff Masachi, um, and yes, that is how he pronounces it, uh, uh, it's not, it's not my uh, getting uh, Mitsoki wrong. Um, uh, we talk a lot about about uh, philosophy and about uh, Nietzsche and Plato and teaching and uh, books and various things. So uh, again, like like the last. Uh, like the last one, uh, the last entry in the series, the, the previous one, uh, uh, Look, Book Six Realism. This, I think, is an interview that will appeal to uh, people, even if they have no interest in, uh, you know, in checking out the San Diego bookstore scene in, in particular. Although uh, I do have a San Diego scene behind me. That is the uh, the art museum in, uh, in San Diego, which I thought was uh, particularly appropriate. Uh, because we talk a lot about about art, uh, and I love the sort of I think it's a Platteresque style um, of uh, of um, uh, architecture. Uh, I believe that's what it is, sort of a Spanish Portuguese uh, style that um, that draws on on bits of Romanesque and Gothic and Moorish and neoclassical and various things. Um, uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, I don't think Frank Lloyd Wright would like it. He'd want to, uh, but, you know, although I really like Frank Lloyd Wright, I, uh, you know, my, uh, my aesthetic values are more eclectic than his, but that's, um, that's a digression, but you know, there are a lot of digressions in this, in this interview, uh, so they, uh, anyway, I think this, again, I think that, uh, this is an interview you will enjoy, even if you're, uh, you know, even if you're not uh, into the series, um, and even if you're not in the market for some of his uh, his uh, his books, because his books are you know, rare first editions that uh, uh, not everyone can afford, but uh, they are. Uh, but um, nevertheless, we have a really interesting discussion about uh, both books. Anyway, so enough. Uh, enough preamble, uh, here comes the interview. Jeff Pizzacci of the Eternal Return uh, bookstore in San Diego, uh, which is a, um, a fairly unusual uh, bookstore. And Jeff, can you tell us a bit about uh, the bookstore and about uh, your history with it and what, what kinds of things you carry and why I can't possibly afford them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a um, lot of questions there. So, you know, the first thing, what kind of a bookstore? Uh, not, it's, it's, 
less of a mm-hmm. bookstore, you know, and more of a, a corner of the, the living room. Um, there's a shop that's run out of the home. Uh, it's interesting. I sometimes, since I'm on Yelp and I have a website and I have a Facebook page, you know, oftentimes I'll get, especially pre-pandemic, I would get phone calls from people who were in San Diego on business saying that they were looking for my shop and they wanted to come and browse. And uh, I would get back in touch with them and, and let them know that, uh, you know, it's, it's not, a, it's not really a bookstore in the traditional sense that we think of where you go and you browse the stacks and find these um, volumes hidden away somewhere. Um, it's a book- so it's out, of, it, it's out of the home. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> a book selling service. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I am very um, specialized as, as uh, we had been communicating by email, you know, you being a philosophy professor and uh, the books that I carry are are almost entirely philosophy books. I can um, see your it, you know your shirt is sort of fits into the theme. Yes, uh, it's the yeah, title I, page. Uh, the uh, critique of pure reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the title page from the first edition of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, um, which is in the history of philosophy one of the one of the more important books to own if you're um, intending to have a sizable. Um, collection in, in Western philosophy. Um, you know, the, the, to the point about being so, so narrowly focused on, on philosophy books, um, another phone call that I often field would be a phone call from someone who has a box of books from their grandparents' attic kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of them are, are sort of literature sets or, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica is from the 70s or something like that. And so I often find myself uh, reminding people that that I'm pretty, pretty niche, pretty, pretty narrowly focused on philosophy. Yeah, um, how do, how, bookstores are fairly unusual, although, the, you know, there's one in Paris, uh, Givrin, mm-hmm. although it's not, it's not antiquarian, it's, it's, it's mainly just sort of contemporary stuff, both, both English and French mainly, but they're, you know, that's, that's the only other you know, philosophy only bookstore that I that I'm aware of offhand. Yeah, a good, uh, a friend of mine, um, and actually kind of related to the story of how I got started, Bill Shaberg of Athena Rare Books in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, I, I really credit him with my, my beginnings. Um, let's see, it was probably, I think it was January or so of 2006. Um, I was just, I was living in San Francisco at the time and just in a, in a bit of boredom, kind of browsing around on the internet, uh, just decided to, uh, in the, the search window on eBay, I just typed Nietzsche. Just, uh, you know, it, it, my background is in, is in philosophy, undergraduate, I have a master's degree. And I also, uh, my, my full-time job is as a teacher. A high school teacher. I teach philosophy and literature, um, but I, I just typed in, and what popped up was the 1893 second edition of Zarathustra in German, um, and it was priced at you know a couple thousand dollars, maybe twenty five hundred, something like that. Um, and I just started communicating with the person who posted it, and I thought, wow, I could own a book that was published while Nietzsche was still alive. Uh, he died in, in 1900, as, as you know. Um, and I, I, I was really enamored by that thought that I, I could, you know, own a book that, that was on this earth at the same time that he was. And I, I have a particular fondness for, for Nietzsche and his philosophy. Um, and so I, I made an offer, a crazy offer, and the, the seller accepted the offer and I ended up acquiring the book. Um, with some, some money that I had tucked away. And then I just started to dig around and do some mm-hmm. research to try to figure out what is this book? Cause Zarathustra has an interesting publication history. The first part published in um, 1883, part two and three, 1884, part four published in a very small uh, private press run of about 40 copies in 1885, but not publicly until 1891. So 1893 represented the first time all four parts of Zarathustra were published together in sequential pagination rather than kind of put together as separate 
um, separately published pieces. So I started to find all this information out and trying to figure out like, what is this book really worth vis-a-vis -vis what I paid for it and had been communicating with this person named William. Um, and as I was contacting other rare booksellers, they said, oh, you really should talk to this guy, Bill, this guy, Bill. And then finally I put two and two together. Bill was William. We had been communicating, Bill Schaeberg of Athena Rare Books, um, because he published a book. I forget the date, um, but it's called the Nietzsche Canon. And it's the, the bibliography of Nietzsche's works, which he did extensive research um, to chronicle the, you know, all the, the, the confusing data and information uh, as it relates to the first editions and the new editions um, of Nietzsche's work. So I got in touch with Bill and I saw that he had some other books that I might be interested in as I wanted to grow my collection from one to two books. <laughs> and it happened to be, like I said, January, I think of 2006. And some of the books I asked about were on their way from Connecticut to Los Angeles because there was a big book fair in Los Angeles, the ABAA um, California Book Fair. And so he said, oh, you should, you should uh, check it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I can send you photos once, once I get those books. And so I remember my, my girlfriend who at the time, now my wife, um, I turned to her when she got home from work and I said, we were living in, as I said, we were living in San Francisco at the time. I said, do you feel like driving down to Los Angeles this weekend? She said, why? I said, oh, there's a rare book fair. And she kind of looked at me with that puzzled look. Um, what are rare books? What's a rare book fair? What does all this mean? Um, but true to, to Rebecca, she just said, yes. Yeah, let's go. Why not? Um, so we drove down to LA and I ended up, I met Bill. Um, and I bought a first edition copy of uh, Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy from 1872, um, which I think is a book that's often overlooked um, in Nietzsche's canon, uh, but it informs so much of his later works. Um, I'm teaching the Nietzsche course this, this coming <clears> term. <throat> I'm, I'm giving a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not just doing the big things, but I'm doing, I'm doing like obscure little works that no one reads. Oh, good. Yeah, I should zoom in <laughs> and attend your class. Um, it would be fun. I'm sure you're probably still zooming into the second uh, semester. Yeah, or I... yeah, which which uh, you know a lot of us out here are doing as well. Um, and so I ended up becoming great friends with Bill, and I continued to acquire some rare books. And then as I would acquire more books, I would find another copy of a book that I already owned, and then I would want to start selling. So I started to work with Bill at book fairs. Um, starting to sell some of my own books and started to grow an inventory of my own and started to, to make some money off of it as well. And so <clears throat> as, um, let's see, that was, you know, 2006, we continued on. And then 2015 was when uh, my wife and I moved down to San Diego. Uh, we have kids and her family is here. And so we wanted to be closer to grandma, et cetera. Um, and I decided at that point, 2015, rather than sort of working with Bill sort of on different sides of the continent, him in Connecticut and me in California, I decided to just launch my own bookshop. Uh, at that point, I had about 200 volumes or so um, that I had acquired and you know, almost entirely philosophy books. Um, I started to move into some of the more philosophically inspired literature um, for a period of time because I also brewed my own beer. I dabbled a bit in um, collecting and selling um, important books in the history of beer brewing. Had some interesting um, books uh, in that field, but decided since I have limited income and limited time and limited space, I wanted to really focus on <clears throat> just philosophy, which is really my first love. Um, and, and so unloaded all those beer books and continue to, to grow my philosophy collection with a few philosophically inspired literature. I have a signed copy of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, um, you know, which is a book that... Invisible Ink. <laughs> yeah, they're all yeah, they're all signed in Invisible Ink. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> have I have a couple? The first two issues of um, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, published in 1866 in the Russian Messenger, um, which is another book that I teach, and you know, sort of thinking about. I'm starting to move in the direction of, um, you know, I, I, I might soon acquire um, 
one of Chernyshevsky's pieces, which was sort of that, that positivism and rational egoism in 19th century uh, Russian philosophy that so much inspired the literature of the time. That was something that Dostoevsky really- the Underground man. So yeah, right, which, which was very influential in, in Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, which also informed uh, Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man, which uh, you, know, you can see a lot of the stylistic elements that are similar, but just as someone who was responding to um, sort of the social constructs of the time. Um, so, you know, the core of my collection really is, is philosophy books um, with, uh, at times, sort of journeying into some of the philosophically inspired literature, um, which I've, I've been cautious about doing because that could open up a whole other, um, you know, thinking about limited funds, limited space that I have, and limited time because my full-time job is as a high school uh, teacher. Um, wanting to, to keep it focused primarily on, on philosophy. Um, and, it, you know, I, I, for a period of time, was acquiring a number of uh, 20th century French philosophy, um, but have even started to, to curb that a bit and trying to focus on 19th century or older um, philosophy, although I still have a number of the 20th century French. So that's kind of, you know, a bit of the story um, kind of in, in broad strokes, uh, you know, about what going on 15 years now of, of being interested in acquiring and uh, dealing in rare philosophy books. So uh, I don't know if you have particular questions stemming off of that, but um, I mean, happy you, to... you mentioned in, you know, in some of the emails, some examples of some particularly, uh, you know, exciting books that you either have or have had. Mm -hmm. um, like these, you know, like the Stephanus Plato. Uh, mm -hmm. So, hey, can you say anything more about you know some of the? You know... Yeah, some of the books that I have. So, um, you can see some of them behind me. Actually, there's uh, you know, some of the shelves that you can see over there. You can see the Stephanus Plato's, the tall. I can actually bring you over and. And, and look, so this is a uh, beautiful, I mean, there we go. Um, three volume, 1578. So the Stephanus Plato, which, you know, as a, a philosophy professor, you know, any translation of Plato's works, you have those numbers in the margins and students are always asking me, what are those numbers in the margins mean? What is, what is you know, 537a mean on the side of, of whatever text from Plato we're reading. And so I told them it, it goes back to the Stephanus Plato, um, which well, is Stephanus the- Stephanus actually Etienne, but- uh, Right, the, right. Uh, and the, the standard for, you know, any kind of notes and so forth around Greek text is also having them in Latin because people mm -hmm. more, people who can read ancient Greek are more likely to share Latin than they are to share any, any modern language. I think it's to some extent still true, though certainly, especially true back then. Yeah, yeah, and so that those you know the pages, the Stephanus or the ATN numbers in the margins correspond to that particular edition, the fifteen seventy eight, um, which I acquired a couple of years ago, um, you know, from someone who does not deal in philosophy, and that's one of the interesting things about sort of this niche um, market and sort of the the upper echelon, I guess, of the rare and antiquarian books and book shops is that a lot of the sellers tend to specialize. And so if they acquire something that's not necessarily in their area of specialty, they'll um, try to move that along quickly to someone who would specialize in that and um, you know, be able to maybe have a customer for that or at least have inventory that, you know, I think a lot of times we, we sellers, especially those of us who started as collectors, um, a lot of times I know for myself, I, I see myself as kind of being mm -hmm. a steward of these books and almost like I'm a curator that mm -hmm. as I acquire books, I try to think about why those books would belong on these shelves behind me and in other places in our house, that what is it that holds them together, whether it's an author, whether it's um, an author and all sort of the, the, the other people around that author who might have written in response to um, the the ideas that are that are are circulating um and so so it, it's interesting to me I, I often think of it as like whirlpools 
um, where you know a book will eventually find its rightful owner or its rightful um, seller slash owner, right? Because I think oftentimes we see ourselves on the fence between a, a collector and a seller. Um, and you know, eventually it finds its right place <clears throat> for a period of time before, you know, ultimately, like I said, we're all stewards of these books. These books have existed long before we have, um, and hopefully will continue to exist long after uh, we, we are gone. Um, and so we're really just taking care of them. And so trying to get them collected together. Um, a recent catalog that I did, uh, maybe not so recent, maybe about a year and a half ago, uh, on the radical enlightenment. Um, I was always interested in Spinoza as a graduate student, um, happened to be able to work with a, a professor who <clears throat> was very, is very Stephen Barboni, um, very influential, writes a lot, um, has published a lot on Spinoza. When I was in grad school, got to work with him and, and really got to know, um, you know, a lot of the ins and outs of Spinoza. And then uh, I forget what year Jonathan Israel published his book, uh, Radical Enlightenment. Uh, Jonathan Israel, I, I believe, is still teaching at Princeton. Um, and that book, you know, it's a thick book. My kids, my eight year old twin boys, often uh, laugh about how that book is always sitting around the house and they pick it up and mm -hmm. pretend to read it at times. But kind of separating what is often seen as you know the the typical epistemological break between the rationalists and the empiricists where you kind of lump Descartes and Spinoza together but really teasing them apart Jonathan Israel between kind of the, the moderate or even the conservative uh, rationalists like Descartes and the more radical ones like Spinoza so a couple of years ago I decided to comb through Jonathan Israel's book after having read it um, and pulled out just in notes, what are some of the big books that were a part of the Radical Enlightenment? Um, and just started to, to acquire them and ended up collecting, gathering together about 15 or 20 volumes um, in and around Spinoza and the Radical Enlightenment. Um, never got a copy of, the, of Spinoza's Tractatus. It's a difficult one to, to acquire, five different printings. There's some confusion about which ones came first, all these issue points, but I do, I still have, um, a copy of, of Spinoza's opera with the ethics in it. Um, but a lot of the books that were informed by Spinoza or informed Spinoza that were highlighted in uh, Jonathan Israel's book. Um, and, and like I said, did a collection of, of, of those that the, it's actually, the, the list is still available on my website. Um, I think it was list number four that I put together, which if uh, anyone who's viewing this goes to eternalreturnbookshop.com. Um, some of my lists are still there, a collection of a rigore, 20th century French, but also the, the Radical Enlightenment uh, list and collection, which at the time included one of the clandestine manuscripts uh, that, were, that were circulating in the early 18th century. Um, and, you know, these, these handwritten manuscripts that people would, would, um, you know, shuffle around Europe that were, uh, meant to, uh, evade the detection of the authorities, um, the ecclesiastical authorities, et cetera, um, because the ideas were, were believed to be so dangerous because of their, their, their lack of, um, idealism, I suppose, and too much materialism that the church saw as, as a threat um, to its very existence. So, which is why Spinoza's, you know, Spinoza's early works, uh, you know, the first editions of his works, his, his name is not on the title page because, um, because of that, because the, 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 the need to publish anonymously was part of what protected the author. Um, Although his, his opera, publicly, oh, go ahead. Locke never publicly acknowledged the two treatises. Um, you know, he acknowledged the essay, but uh, mm -hmm. not the two treatises because even after the, you know, after the revolution that the two treatises were supposedly written in support of, yeah. um, uh, he still obviously thought that his treatises were more radical than the, than the regime that he had helped inaugurate would have been mm -hmm. happening. So, he stood, he had the copy filed in his own library under A for anonymous. <laughs> uh, his, his, um, his, uh, his uh, rough manuscript for it, he had filed with his medical papers and it was titled De Morbo Gallico, the French disease, mm -hmm. which was the 
the term Persepolis, mm -hmm. uh, though it could also be sort of code for tyranny. Um, and he would break with friends if they ever publicly mentioned that he was the author, even though eventually it did become sort of an open secret. Yeah, yeah. And that was, that was the case for a lot of the writers of that time. It was just, you know, walking that fine line between wanting to um, safely publish their ideas, um, but also to publish their ideas, which sometimes were not always seen as, as safe. I mean, one um, of Big Dark's earliest works, The World or The Treatise on Light, he was mm -hmm. about to publish when news came from Italy as to what was going on with Galileo. Yeah. Know? And he had he had uh, he had also um, defended a uh, heliocentric uh, cosmos in uh, the world, among other possibly dangerous views. And so mm -hmm. he thought, I think I'll just sit on this a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. So although he certainly was more conservative than Spinoza, um, you know, he was you know, he was radical enough that he was you know, he was always yep. near the edge of, of trouble. Which yeah, and I think the reason he moved to Holland, where where things were. Uh, you know, things were a little bit more uh, liberal for uh, for writers. Yeah, and I think it was in the dedication to his meditations where he, you know, kind of acknowledges this new science, but in a way that allows the church to accept it. In some ways, I mean, I, I always characterize it as, you know, the, 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 science and the world can have the body and the church can have the mind or the soul and so his dualism allows for the church to not feel threatened by the materialism of the new science because that's the realm of of physics and and science um and then the church can maintain the mind and then spinoza's like you know forget about all that it's all it's all um you know just just the same substance just different attributes of that well, ended up not liking what descartes had to say about the mind either <laughs> yeah yeah right right yeah, um, because of its its uh, idealism, um, I, I, I suppose. So yeah, so so that I mean that was a really exciting catalog that I put together when I stumbled across that idea. And um, you know, to what I was questioning earlier, is Jonathan Israel still teaching at at Princeton? He is because actually I the the rare book librarian from Princeton contacted me. Gosh, it must be about a year ago. Um, so maybe it was a couple years ago that I did the catalog, but she said that she said she told me Professor Israel was very impressed with my my collection. He found my website and there was one of the books that I had that their um, special collections library didn't have. And so um, because um, he noticed that he they ended up purchasing one of the books from me, which was was pretty exciting to 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 have that, um, you know, the person who wrote the book that got me to do that catalog. Uh, reached out and and I was able to sell sell him a book. So, um, well, so things come back that way. The kind yeah. of eternal return. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, and the eternal return. I think there's so many layers to that. Number one, it's you know this idea that these books are always returning to their their home, whatever that is. Right. You know, you said this... that about sort of the books going on after us and so forth. I, I remember thinking, I wonder whether that's connected with the title of the. It is, and then all obviously, I mean, much more obviously when you see the. The logo of the bookshop too. It's you know Nietzsche and the idea of the eternal return, um, and you know the rock of the eternal return is is worked into because a friend of mine who's a graphic artist helped to to design that logo. Um, but in Sils Maria in Switzerland, where Nietzsche would spend a lot of time, especially in the 80s, the 1880s, uh, he would do these walks along the lake, and he when he came to that rock, um, and I've been there. It's actually that 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 rock is where I asked my girlfriend at the time now wife uh to 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 ma to get married um at that that rock very cool yeah so there's a personal reason and there's a philosophical reason and then there's also kind of the book itself um but anyway i interrupted you what were you gonna say yeah, i was you interrupted me interrupting you uh <laughs> in my um in my Nietzsche and modern literature class i have uh i have this website that's called an audio visual companion oh. because the um the books were reading both by Nietzsche and by the other authors like Thomas Mann and mm -hmm. D.H. Uh, Lawrence and so forth. They have all these references both to places yep. and to bits of pieces of art and pieces of music and they're talking about them in great detail and if the um, 
you know, the students don't know what any of those are, they're not really getting the thing. So I have, so I have things with like, you know, with photos of the places, including like that rock and, mm -hmm. and clips from some of the music that they, that, yeah. that they're talking about and uh, some of the artworks that they're discussing and so forth, because, uh, you know, I mean, I don't say anything particularly deep about them, but I just think that, uh, you know, if they, if they really want to understand what these works are writing, because these works are so invested in in discussing these things. That, yeah. Uh, and, and Nietzsche, of course, is just constantly talking about his his physical environment. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. And his whole his whole mood and his ability even to function depends on on location and whether he's mm -hmm. in, in what he's at that moment regarding as a favorable uh, location or not. And so I want to show photos of those things. Anyway, yeah, so. it's so no, that's so important. And I mean, you know, books and bookshop aside, just uh, our connection as as teachers, as as colleagues, really, um, and thinking about all of the the subtle ways that the the illusions in the books that we teach are so important to understand and getting the students to to listen to the pieces of music. Um, remember uh, when I was living in San Francisco, I took a class at Stanford on uh, Nietzsche, Wagner, and the philosophy of pessimism. And so much of that class involved um, listening to the operas of Wagner, Tristan and Isolde, in contrast with Parseval, for example, and how Nietzsche loved one and, and didn't like the other, and sort of thinking about what the music is doing and understanding the music. I oftentimes in when I'm teaching Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, I get the students to listen to the musical references because uh, Ralph Ellison had studied music and <clears throat> every song, every every piece of music that he mentions is is intentional and to get the students to to you know to to listen. For example, I forget which chapter. I think it's the end of chapter five um, after Homer Barbie's. Uh, sermon he hears the narrator hears simultaneously Dvorak's New World Symphony and echoes of Swing Low Sweet Chariot from his mother and his grandmother and so I play what's what's wonderful about technology today right you can you can just punch those two things up on YouTube at the same time and listen to them simultaneously and then the students start to understand the experience that <clears throat> excuse me Ralph Ellison is trying to get us to understand about the narrator and so I think that's 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 great. I'm going to check out that that um, the sights and sounds that you mentioned. That yeah, no, that, that is so important. And just when I was in Sils Maria and walking along the lake and taking in the sights, and we actually while we were in Sils Maria, we we lodged at the Nietzsche house. We were able to stay there for the week that we were there. And um, Peter, who's the curator there, uh, was was great, just giving us access to all kinds of stuff and tips and and. And things, and uh, it, just to to be able to understand more what the what the words on the pages mean, and it's interesting because it, this is triggering a, a thought that I've often had too. You know, I I studied Nietzsche, I studied Spinoza when I was in graduate school, when I was an undergrad, um, but when I started to to get into rare books and I started to understand the publication history of their books and the struggles that they faced and the, the ways in which they went about publishing their works. That was something that was not really part of the curriculum when I was studying the works themselves as a student. And so I, I think it's even more true for Nietzsche because he went through so many struggles with getting things published and how poorly his works were received and how first editions would the unsold sheets would get turned into new editions. And what that means when you have a thousand of them printed, but only 192 sell and you have all these extras and then you create a new preface 10, 15 years later for a new edition. It, it understanding the publication history of particular titles got me to understand even more the layers of what was going on uh, in the works themselves. And it, it, it it made me realize, and I, I do this a little bit as a teacher, <clears throat> it made me realize how important it is to, to make the struggles of publication or the history of the publication itself part of the ideas that are being taught because you can't, um, you can't separate the two. You know, when, when, 
when Nietzsche believed so strongly in his ideas and to see that the public just disregarded them, you know, or take someone like Schopenhauer, one of, you know, a book that I, I used to own, the first printing of um, World as Will and Representation, how poorly that sold. And all of the unsold copies were just pulped. <laughs> I mean, what does that do to the psyche of the author who poured their life into that, that particular work and just to have it just get pulped or get reissued in another edition that also doesn't sell. Um, I remember a story about his mother was a, was a famous novelist and yeah. Schopenhauer's early works was called The Fourfold Root of the Principle of Sufficient Reason. Uh -huh. And his mother looked at the title and said, Fourfold Root, oh, you've taken up horticulture now, have you? <laughs> Schopenhauer typically replied, Madam, my books will be remembered when years are long forgotten. <laughs> I didn't know that story. That's a good one. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, misunderstood even by his own mother, and and what that what that does to the psyche of the of the author um, is I, I, it's it's just important, and it's 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 part of the book. It's part of the ideas, and you know. Uh, a book contains ideas, but a book is also an object that has a place in history. Um, you know, and I, I just think that's that's part of what is exciting to me about um, this bookshop. <laughs> you know, back to sort of the the reason for for this interview, the bookshop itself, and um, you know, the the hobby slash avocation. <laughs> Uh, that it has become in in my life, um, and thinking about you know not just you know a title and a first edition, but you know a particular copy, right? The provenance of that copy. Um, I have a copy of uh, the third untimely meditation of of Nietzsche's, the one on Schopenhauer as educator. Um, 1873, I believe it is. I have a copy of that in the original wrappers that is inscribed by Nietzsche to Helen Zimmern because Helen Zimmern had recently published a book on Schopenhauer, his biography. Um, and Helen Zimmern was close friends with the Wagners and the Wagners liked Schopenhauer. And so I don't know if it was Richard or Cosima Wagner who encouraged Nietzsche to send a copy of his Schopenhauer essay to, to Helen Zimmern, who Nietzsche hadn't even met yet. Um, and so he, 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 you know, inscribed and then signed it, you know, the author and had it sent to her. And then later they became really good friends and they spent a lot of time together in Sils Maria. And then she ended up being the one who translated Beyond Good and Evil. And I think just the first, volume of Human All Too Human uh, into English um, in the early 20th century, um, 1907, 1909, I think is when those were published in English. So I have the Schopenhauer book by Helen Zimmern in first edition. I have the copy of the Schopenhauer essay inscribed by Nietzsche to Helen Zimmern. And I have the copies of Human All Too Human and Beyond Good and Evil translated into English by Helen Zimmern. And so like, again, kind of the, the way that I see my role as curator, like bringing these books together because their relationships to each other as objects, not just as ideas, but as objects, both of those things kind of coming together. Um, there's I'm just- torn between the, you know, the, the aims of a bookseller and the aims of a librarian slash yeah. museum curator. Cause that's the part yes. of it. It wants to just keep these books together and you know and then you know i have private showings of them and then there's the part of you that says you know both in order to make money in order to and also <laughs> to get them to people who you know who value them there's the right goals to sell but you know that i would i would i would find that an agonizing tension if i were here it partner. is that's a great that's a perfect way to 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 capture it it's an agonizing tension people often talk about buyer's remorse right um, you, know, you buy the car, you drive it off the lot, damn, why did I buy that? Or any expensive thing, right? But I've often experienced seller's remorse where I, I sell a book and then I think, wait a minute, I, 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 want, I want to still have that. 
book <laughs> and will I ever be able to to acquire it again because they're so elusive um particularly books that that maybe belong with other books or um you know books that you know it's a particular copy that has particular resonance but yeah it's, it's an agonizing tension um that that emerges oftentimes you know I I, I said earlier I I currently have a copy of Spinoza's opera uh, from 1677, uh, which contains his ethics, uh, first edition. But it's the second copy that I've had. I had a copy years ago, and then I sold it, and I had complete seller's remorse. I, I, I missed that book. I loved that book, the original Vellum. Um, and so I, there are a handful of books that some of them I don't have listed um, because I, I don't think I'm ready to depart um, with them. And, you know, some I do have listed, but maybe the price is a little higher than it should be um, because I, it's, it's, it's one that, that I, I'm not ready to, to let go, but I think it's an important one to, to maybe have out there. Um, and then, you know, w to think about the, I, the eternal return, right? And sort of the books sort of um, we're stewards of the books and getting them to the right owners. One of the things that I love about my bookshop, and it's probably because it's so small and it's so niche, is that I really get to know all my customers. Um, sometimes someone will ask me about a book and we'll start emailing about ideas. Maybe they'll never buy the book, but we've almost become friends um, because we share this, this um, joy really for the the particular ideas in a book a particular author whatever it might be and and i think that's great i it, i'm not in this to sell books necessarily although that's nice um you know it, it's it's part of it's it's a community of of passionate um sometimes mad people uh there was a um a book written a number of years ago. Um, I'm, I'm, my mind is blanking on the author, but it's called The Gentle Madness. And it's about sort of the, the madness that is involved in rare objects and rare books and ideas and how, you know, we're not always governed by, by rationality, that there are other domains of the self that are far more active in the process of, of, of buying and selling the books. Um, so it would, it would upset, it would upset Plato greatly to think of the, the, the horses in charge of the chariot rather than the charioteer, but oftentimes it's one of the horses that, that's driving the chariot. Well, in the, there's the tension in Plato too, because yeah. he's talking about the divine madness. <clears throat> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that maybe it is a divine madness rather than a, another kind of madness that is at work in the 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 gentleness of the madness that um that's described in that book. Um, so, but but it's nice to to come in contact with and to to meet people who uh, like yourself, people who have just a, a strong interest and understanding of of the ideas and appreciation of the. The, the the sights and sounds and the time and the 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 publication history and the spot in history that that these books and these ideas and these writers represent um, whether a book is sold or not is is um, insignificant uh, it's it's the the community one of the things that I really miss in these COVID times is uh, the community at the community feeling at these, these book fairs, you know, everything has gone online, both in teaching and in book fairs. There are now, you know, book fairs are virtual book fairs where you don't get to walk around and, you know, see friends of mine who live in Denmark, for example, um, that I only get to see at the book fairs and, you know, other people that I get to meet at book fairs that is uh, hopefully will return post-COVID once everyone's, uh, I don't know, whatever the world looks like on the other side, but it's, it's something that I miss is kind of the, the gathering together of, the, of those communities. Um, and I find teaching online really frustrating. I mean, it yeah. has some advantages. I mean, <clears throat> I, you know, I, it gives me more, more time. I don't have to 
circle endlessly looking for a parking spot on campus and so forth and I can just roll out of bed and teach but <clears throat> but um, <laughs> but it's not really the same kind of engagement yeah. you just got a bunch of zoom blocks especially since a lot of them don't show their faces they just blank out so that some of them have genuine privacy concerns others I think just want to be on their phones <laughs> yeah yeah yep yeah, yeah um, I see that too and you must do you have large lecture halls uh, no, fortunately, our classes in the philosophy department tend to be very small. So the um, that's good. The largest classes tend to be about you know, 30, 35 or so. Mm -hmm. that was, that's initially required by the fire code, although, of course, obviously, right right now, uh, <laughs> you know, there's no fire code limitation on, on Zoom, but right. uh, the administration hasn't figured that out yet. Uh, <laughs> And the um, and then our smaller classes, uh, you know, in the ten to twenty, yeah, range, uh, uh, for the you know, for the upper level classes for majors, um, so you know, so that's good, um, yeah, because oh, I hate it when the when the class is so big that they that not all the squares will appear on my screen, yeah, to keep going back and forth between the, <clears throat> which occasionally I get because I, I do this on my laptop because my um, well, my 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 webcam with my regular computer just doesn't. There's a in, they were at one time they were compatible and then an incompatibility arose. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm doing everything on my laptop, which doesn't show as many squares. But anyway, whatever. Yeah, no, I struggle with that too because oftentimes I'm doing putting up slides, Zoom slides, and that results in only some of the students being shown at the top, and I have to scroll through, and then I realize too late that a student was actually trying to say something <laughs> in the discussion and it's uh so then i try to you know close the slideshow but then we don't have the common um image in front of us whatever it might be but uh on the, but yeah on, I, on the question of teaching i'm, I'm curious that um you know, <clears throat> philosophy at the pre-college level is pretty unusual uh um, yeah uh, I, uh at the beginning of, of my intro classes i often ask students how many of you had had philosophy in high school and usually no hands go up occasionally yeah. one or two do so how did that come about i just made it happen to be honest i mean I, my my um i started off teaching ethics um you know it it my educational background undergraduate degrees in in english religious studies philosophy kind of cobbled together a mix of majors and minors got a master's degree in philosophy and then another one in religious studies and so found myself kind of at that intersection but started working in private schools teaching ethics and then you know a lot of schools have ethics classes a lot of private schools do and then trying to like using that as a way to bring more um sort of the rigor of philosophy and actually reading philosophical texts and then would get you know, critical mass of students that really got interested in in my classes and the ideas that we're covering. And so um, longer that I teach at a school, the more and especially in private independent schools, you're able to to pitch a class for the subsequent year and get it approved rather quickly. Independent schools can be quite nimble in responding to the desires of students and and the the expertise of the teachers. And so our um, class approval uh, process is very lengthy and bureaucratic. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure, as it is well, with know, the public I mean, high schools it, it here. It could be worse. We we have managed to, you know, to get a fair number of new courses through, so the process works. But yeah, it just yeah, takes time. A lot of hoops. No, at a private independent high school, I could, you know, in, in February or March, um, have enough students interested in the class. I put up a proposal, run it through the department, run it through the school, and we could get it approved for the next year. Um, and sometimes what I do too, the longer that and I've been teaching 20, 25 years the more I can um, sort of get away with describing a class with broad strokes, and then within that framework, be able to pivot um, and do different things. Um, you know, so a class that I teach to honors seniors right now is philosophy and literature, right? Well, that's a lot of things, you know, so it's in the English. You don't department. have to do the same thing every time, certainly. Right, right. And I, and I, I often don't, right? But, um, you know, it, 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 it changes, you know, based on the interests of the students. I'll put together a, a longer book list and we won't read all the books or sometimes it'll be, you know, some, some shorter things that are free public access that, um, that we can read like philosophy texts. So, you know, to, to be able to, to have a class that is labeled in broad strokes gives me that, that room within it 
so that I don't have to pitch a new class every year where, you know, one year it's going to be 19th century Russian literature and all the influences there. Another, it's going to be, you know, sort of utopia, dystopia. I don't have to deal with all that. I just, let's just call it philosophy and literature and then play within that space each year um, and give a good, um, you know, mix of philosophy texts and novels and short stories and it all works. Um, and so that's kind of how I've done it. Um, my friend Bill Sheberg, actually, Athena Rare Books, who I was talking about at the beginning, um, kind of got me into this whole book world. He would often laugh um, whenever we would be talking with someone who was interested in my role as a teacher, and Bill would just laugh and say, it doesn't matter what Jeff is teaching, at least in the course catalog, he's always teaching philosophy. And I think that that's true. Like, I always do, would just find ways to introduce, um, you know, excerpts from Nietzsche texts or Kierkegaard or um, I mean the, the existentialists tend to be the ones that are a little bit more easily integrated into a high school philosophy and literature class um, you, know, you can do you can do some of Sartre's short stories for example the wall I love teaching the wall um, you know there are just a lot actually, of actually well fits in very well with that, with that, um, that piece by Kant on uh on a, uh, on a supposed right to lie for philanthropic motives, because it, it's sort of the same example that you're, mm -hmm. you lie about, you know, you lie to the, um, <clears throat> to the bad guys about where the, um, uh, about where the good guy is hiding, but it turns yeah. out your lie is accidentally true. Yeah. So Kant and Sartre draw different morals. And Kant, yeah, yeah. The, um, you know, the moral is you're, you're responsible for the, bad results of what you do if what you do is inherently wrong but not otherwise mm -hmm. start you're responsible for anything and everything no matter what right so it makes it so so Kant and start there's sort of interesting uh, contrast yeah 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 definitely maybe i'll include that Kant as we read the wall this year if we get around to it because one of the struggles with teaching in the zoom room and the zoom schedule i don't know if this is true at the college level but it certainly is at the high school level in order to do these um, sort of what's the, the, I'm blanking on the, the word for it. these cohorts, right? Whether students are on campus or off campus, you have to have the same group of students. And that means that you have to have some classes on some days and some classes on another. So um, this year, our, the number of meetings that we have with our students has almost been cut in half. So we have so little, we have so much less time uh, to get through the work. So a lot of the work just isn't covered. I usually teach King Lear in my philosophy and literature class. Um, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that's going to be cut. I think it's also just partly because I, I, I imagine it's, it's hard to teach Shakespeare in the Zoom room that I think requires a lot of in-person um, heavy lifting. Uh, whereas it, it's, it's not, not that not that reading Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done, Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, um, and some of the philosophy texts that will start into some of the, the Sartre and Camus um, don't require the heavy lifting. But there's something about Shakespeare that is is always uh, difficult to do. And, and they need a lot of person. guidance on the, you know, on the language. Yeah, yeah. yeah even the editions will have little, you know, will have little footnotes. Yeah. Um, uh still a uh you know they can find it uh tough going yeah uh, it's often easier to uh to understand if you're you know if you're watching a a movie because the a good mm -hmm. actor can convey the meaning uh, yeah. of it even if you don't literally know what the words mean although sometimes the actual whether deliberately or otherwise convey a different meaning from the from the actual <laughs> i know words. i, I know in, in derek jacoby's hamlet uh uh he says at one point, you know, just the breathing time of day with me. And he says it as though it meant, you know, it's all one to me, I don't care. Yeah. Which is not what that phrase means. It means it's my exercise time. Right. Um, but it works in the scene. I think it was you know, a deliberate choice on his part to, uh, uh, you know, to screw with the language uh, to convey yeah. it. But anyways, the, uh, he did, at least the important thing is to convey some meaning. Because if you just, you're just saying a bunch of words and the and they are right. doing it. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it, right? To convey some meaning, um, to, to make a choice. Um, you know, so, sometimes I'll show, oftentimes with King Lear, I'll show the, um, the 
I think it was in Central Park, maybe 1973, um, James Earl Jones um, playing the, the role of Lear. I think that's a, that's a pretty good um, version, but I think it's also good. And I, I've done this with Macbeth when I used to teach sophomores in a, a general humanities class and we would read Macbeth, but show three or four different movie versions of the same scene and get the students to unpack, like, why did this version do it this way? Why did that version do it that way? And get to what you said, right? Like, ultimately we can disagree, but we can clearly see that a choice was made in each of those, whether we agree with the choice, whether we think it's consistent or inconsistent with the context, um, a choice was made and that it's not just delivering words that's empty. I remember um, when my mother was taking, uh, she, my mother was getting her college degree at the same time that I was getting my PhD. Uh, oh, exciting. Uh, yeah. So um, anyway, so she was taking this course on Shakespeare and film. And so I would, I would <clears throat> go and see all these Shakespeare films. So it was really fascinating to see how the, you know, the same, you know, the same story would be done very differently depending on what, yeah. you know, uh, um, Peter Brooks or Kozinsaf or, Mm -hmm. uh whoever um uh doing it that was you know really enjoyed those films um most of the most of the novels that i'm doing in this course have films associated with them but there's no particularly easy way to to show them in a um yeah uh, in a zoom session um so i can just tell them about them uh, I, yeah, <laughs> I have I have the trailers for the movies on um, <laughs> on uh, on that website. So if they uh, if they're interested in tracking down the movies, they can't they can't. If they're right. Involved. I'm also also I'm talking about music. I also have clips from Nietzsche's own musical compositions on there. Oh yeah, yeah. That's um sometimes that that text pops up at auction um, every once in a while and. Uh, I've been tempted. I've never, I've never owned that um, the text itself. I think it was published in 1887, um, and I think it was isn't that um, hymns of life where Nietzsche wrote the music and didn't um, Lou Salome. Salome write the the words? Yeah. yeah. If thou hast no bliss, no now no bliss now left to crown me, lead on. Thou hast thy sorrow still. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I remember discovering discovering those lyrics in college actually. Um, mm -hmm. I took a course on Nietzsche, Nietzsche and modern literature in college. It's, I sort of, it's a remote uh, inspirer of the one I'm teaching now, even though we didn't do like, all the same stuff. But um, right, and I don't think I discovered that particular text in in that class. But anyway, I was sort of on a Nietzsche kick in college. Yeah, it was funny. A, a student of mine a few years ago. I don't know, we, we were reading something of Nietzsche and he, he came into class and he said that he was talking with his grandfather and his grandfather was really excited, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that he was reading this stuff. I think it was excerpts from the gay science and birth of tragedy and some other things that I had the students read. Um, and so I was talking with my student about him and his grandfather and I thought that was great that he was able to connect with his grandfather around these ideas and I started to learn a little bit more about his grandfather's life and his grandfather studied philosophy uh, at Princeton and he was a philosophy major and that's one of the reasons why he was so excited that my my student his grandson was was reading this stuff and um, he said that his grandfather was telling him about his first his freshman year intro to philosophy class and how he was in there and the teacher just came in and wrote Nietzsche in big letters on the front board and he said that that's all that they would be reading that semester and he got really into into it and I said oh who was this professor and he said oh let me I'll go home and I'll ask my grandfather and he came back the next day and he he said oh yeah my grandfather he said that his his professor was was Walter Kaufman <laughs> and I was I said I said to my students I said I said Ben look at that book because one of the books I have my students get is Kaufman's Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre um, which I think is just a great collection of of short pieces and I said close the book who's who's whose name is on the front of that and he said Walter oh my grandfather's teacher was Walter Kaufman this is the book that we have and he suddenly like saw this whole these world when I was visiting, I was visiting uh, um, at Brown to give a um, give a well. I was it wasn't a lecture. I was participating in the workshop. Anyway, whatever. Anyway, so the the taxi driver who took me up, who was taking me uh, into Brown, 
uh, uh, for some reason, he asked my name, which taxi drivers usually don't, but mm -hmm. uh, I said, it's Roderick Long. He said, Roderick, he said, oh, I used to know, and I, I said, I was going to this philosophy thing. He said, oh, I used to know a, a philosopher named Roderick who taught around here, <laughs> Roderick, Roderick, something Roderick, Roderick Chisholm. And I said, that's one of the most famous <laughs> philosophers in analytic philosophy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so funny. He was telling me about yeah, how this guy used to play, I forget what musical instrument he played, <clears throat> I didn't know about, and obviously yeah. I had forgotten. Um, but, you know, so this taxi driver happened to know <laughs> guy who was like, really famous. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny when those 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 pieces get get put together it's uh yeah my student is funny when he when he recognized that was the the teacher that his grandfather is talking about was the guy who put together this book that we were reading <laughs> yeah and i really like kaufman's translations even though they're not always as accurate as some of the other ones yeah he really, really captures the style and feel uh, yeah uh, which is always that's always the tension right i mean i remember reading taking class just on Heidegger's being in time and, you know, the question of, of translation and, you know, it's, it's, you, you want to get the one that's kind of clumsy because it gets that, that, that feel of the, of the German rather than some that are, that try to nuance it a bit too much. I talk about that a lot with my students in reading Dostoevsky and thinking about the different translations and how, um, you know, some of the translators try to massage the language a little bit to add variety to the syntax or the diction. And it's like, no, that's not what Dostoevsky was intending. You need to have, you know, I think it's in the, the Volokonsky translation where they go back to in Notes from Underground, part one, sections like seven and eight where, and there's a note about this in the preface, but I think it's something like 18 times the word want or wanting appears you know, Kotenya and how, how a lot of English translators try to make the, the English version a little bit more um, stylistically varied <laughs> by changing some of the wanting to choice to give it some variety. And it just uh -huh. didn't, it loses that, that feel that of the original. And so, um, yeah, I think Kaufman kind of keeps a lot of that feel. Um, that other translators don't necessarily. Yeah, and sometimes, sometimes translators uh, miss the point. For example, the um, uh, I'm giving I'm using a different translation of Andre Gide's Immoralist this mm -hmm. time than what I used last time because last time I used the Penguin translation, which I hadn't read before, but it looked all right. Um, yeah. But there's this you know there's this one line that's very important in it where um, uh, where um, uh, well two different characters say it at different points. You can't expect each each one of them, each of these people. You can't expect each one of them to differ from all the others, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is a pretty literal <clears throat> translation of of the French, and also sort of conveys the idea, you know, the supposed idea. I mean, it's not you know we're supposed to be rejecting this idea, but it's the idea that um, that being a, being an uh, individual is is some kind of task too difficult to expect anyone to have to live up to. And the Penguin translation has, you can't expect them all to be different. Yeah. It doesn't have the same feel as, right. you can't expect each one to differ from all the others, which is both more literally faithful and captures the idea better. And so, yeah. Uh, and so on the basis of that, of that just one line, I thought, I'm not using this translation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I got the new translation, which I haven't fully read yet, but I just took yeah. that line and that. That line is is correct in the in the new translation I'm using. I haven't, you know, I may find something else that uh, that displeases me, but um, but that is, but yeah, there are some lines that you, there's no wiggle room. Like you have to get that line right. It's like the you know the it's like the the, the keystone, right? It, it, if that is not right, then then the rest just in some ways falls apart. But uh, but yeah, that's it's it's hard with teaching things in translation um to to get that which sometimes you know I'll, I'll dig out you know i i won't necessarily bring to my classroom maybe the original first edition of a of a book um to show them the the original german or the original russian or whatever it might be um the original french um although now on the zoom room i can you know kind of hold it up and show them but but to to go back to like how how did this become that um you know, it's it's like a, a slightly more intellectual version of the telephone game. 
<laughs> yeah. And of course, with the um, you know, with a lot of I also do a lot of you know ancient Greek stuff, and that's the case where we are. we don't have the you know we don't have the first step in the in the chain. We don't have the yeah. first steps uh, <clears throat> in the chain, and we know very little about the circumstances of production of the original uh, yeah. uh, texts. Um, uh, so you know that story that you know that you like to do of following the the text and we the, we have to sort of we, we have to sort of pick that up in you know in uh you know in medias race because uh, mm -hmm. we don't you know we can't really get back to the uh origin we don't often we don't know the order in which the books were yeah were written we often have good guesses uh, right for many of them but there are always some where you know there's some uh, with plato we've got you know i think there's some good arguments for a rough chronological ordering of them but there yeah. are also some dialogues that you know, sort of float around mysteriously where there's some good evidence for it's being late and there's some good evidence for it's being earlier and we don't know and right the ancients didn't care that much because the ancients had this a lot of the ancient readers of plato had this idea that plato formed his whole system boom at one yeah. time. uh and then everything he wrote was simply you know <clears throat> something being emitted from the system that was you know, well i mean there were two there were two factions of Platonists. there were the there were the dogmatists who thought that he came up with this whole complete system and then everything he wrote was an expression of this one yeah. system and then there were the skeptics who thought he had no positive views and he was just casting doubt on things mm -hmm. but the the intermediate view that he had positive views but he hadn't worked out everything and he changed his mind over time which you might think is the most plausible interpretation had very few people yeah uh, i mean all aristotle who you know should know having worked with plato for 20 years aristotle make, pretty make, makes clear that he thinks plato changes mind over time but um, yeah but uh you know because because so many ancient interpreters had this monolithic view of of what plato was doing right they were, weren't that interested in the in the chronological sequence and the same yeah. thing happened with you know, with you know with all the other uh uh, Greek philosophers, they were also seen as having some system that, you know, came out of their heads, like, you know, Athena bursting out of Zeus's head, fully mm -hmm. formed. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why they thought that, because they, they must have known that didn't work with their own, in their own case, but maybe they oh, Well, I know, that's, that's the thing. It's like, Greek, these great thinkers you know, you, must, must be somehow different. <laughs> yeah, I know, because you just think, like, how often do we look at something that we wrote 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and we just want to distance ourselves from it immediately? Like, oh, that's not what I meant. I can't believe I was thinking that at the time and, you know, to understand the evolution. So why would you expect some other, you know, unless you just see them as a God figure, right? Who just descends and there they are living that perfect life where everything is communicated with precision and accuracy. And then they, they ascend back to the realm of the gods. <laughs> um, you know, these, but, but it's, it's, it's not. Um, of course, you know, it would be very, it would be difficult to take that line with Nietzsche, though I'm sure people have, but Nietzsche makes, you know, Nietzsche is quite critical of his earlier yeah. writing. And I, you know, I love one of my favorite, and it, it, it is one of my favorite books of his, but it's the new edition, the 1886 Birth of Tragedy and the preface. Um, and I often have my students read that because I think he gives such a good explanation as he, as he is attempting to distance the book Birth of Tragedy from being read through too heavy of a Schopenhauer lens and this um, the the pessimism. And you know, he he proposes quite clearly in um, just the first few paragraphs of the preface to Birth of Tragedy, um, you know, sort of separating a pessimism of decline on the one hand and then a naive optimism on the other hand, and asserts that what he's doing is this pessimism of strength, right? Like raising that question that, and, and it, I, I often teach that preface as we head into King Lear, because I think so many of the characters in King Lear are in that question, that the, you know, the, the question mark of existence, life is suffering, which I mean, the first of the four noble truths of Buddhism is right there, right? That life is suffering, what do we do? We either, um, concoct this bulwark that is erected against the truth, right? That naive optimism. Or we are so pessimistic that we just give up. But is there an opportunity for pessimism of strength where it's not this naive optimism erecting a bulwark against the truth? 
Um, but it's not giving up in the face of adversity, but it's marshalling the courage to live through that, that adversity in a way that is, is authentic. And that, that I, I just think that that's so great because he, he recognized, you know, 14 years after Birth of Tragedy was published in 1872, um, how misunderstood it was and, and also how his thought had evolved. And this gets back to a point that I was making earlier, you know, having studied Nietzsche and read Birth of Tragedy as a student, you just read it, right? Whether it's the Penguin edition or whatever edition it is, you're not attending as much to 14 year gap between the first edition and the second edition. You're just reading it. Here's the preface. Here's the, you know, but, but to take that preface, looking back 14 years and having him further articulate a more mature thinking on his part, but also an evolution of his thinking in a way that is so succinct. And so yeah. um, it, it just, like I said, it, it works beautifully for my students because they can then look at those different options and characters that we then go on to read. And then they get to nuance, understand because his, his Nietzsche's attitude to his early writings is not, you know, it's not like it's utter rejection. It's not like, right. I reject that entirely. Uh, it's, uh, I w <clears throat> it's more like, I, I want to direct your attention to the threads in that work that are the root, you know, are the roots of what I think now. Yeah. And pay less attention to some of the things I was distracted by at yeah. the time, the excessive attention to Wagner and Schopenhauer and so mm -hmm. forth that I'm not so much into now. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, although you know, his rest, his his wrestling with Wagner is complicated because it was never a complete rejection, even when he's right. at the nastiest. Yeah. He has that wonderful line when he says something like. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, his, so in the, um, uh, in one of the Wagner, his works on Wagner, he, he praises Bizet's Carmen at the expense of mm -hmm. Wagner, but then somewhere else he says, you know, I'm only half joking when yeah. I, uh, <laughs> when I praise Bizet at the expense of Wagner. Right, right. It's a complicated thing to say. All right, so, <laughs> so he's, only, so he's, 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 he's half joking. I mean, I mean that, that's not literally what he says, but something like that. It, He's yeah, half yeah. joking and half serious when he praises yeah. the expense of Wagner. <laughs> that's you know that's sort of more interesting than than saying either, well, I'm still you know completely team Wagner or <laughs> yeah. you know completely team Bizet. Um, you know, there's well, it's find attractive about both of them, but you know, it was a Wagner somehow deeper, but also in some way more more problematic. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it 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 almost leads you to that you know that that wonderful Nietzsche punctuation choice, which is the ellipsis, right? That it's just I'm gonna I'm gonna to say something that you're gonna have to think about for a while. <laughs> Copeland turns into dashes, which is yeah questionable. I mean, it um, it's a, it gives a different feel to the style, and I think yeah. probably. You know, probably my my feeling for Nietzsche is influenced by having read Kaufman first, and so yeah, I always feel the dashes, but I know that they're really ellipses in the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a softer cliffhanger with yeah. the ellipsis than the. I, I, the... I understand why he why Kaufman did it because the ellipsis is such a, a common way of expressing in English that something's been left out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's some kind of editorial intrusion. <clears throat> in fact, I'm sorry that we don't have. A way of distinguishing between an ellipsis, a clear way of distinguishing between an ellipsis that's in the original and an ellipsis yeah. that we, we, the editor, have. have Although there's made. there are a lot of dashes in Nietzsche's original. I'm going to have to go yeah, back. Now you, 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 you piqued no my back. interest as a as a, a punctuation nerd. Um, you've you've piqued my interest. One sometimes I have my students invent their own forms of punctuation and then um, show how they would use that. For example, I actually had when I was doing that assignment with my high school students, I had my kids who were six years old at the time create their own punctuation, and I added it to my classroom wall. But um, but as a punctuation nerd, now I kind of want to go back to look at some of the original and take those places where I have seen the ellipsis in the translation and see if maybe there was a dash there instead of the ellipsis in the original and um, and uh, and try to make sense of that. That's- uh, I'm reminded of Victor Borges' old routine of, of reading the punctuation aloud. You know, mm -hmm. and, yeah. You know, do you know that old routine of his? Yeah. The sound effects for all the uh, yep. punctuation. Yep. 
I should actually have my students do that. Add, what does that punctuation mark sound like? That, that'd be fun. And then they can present. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a very old routine of his because I, 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 my mother remembers why my, my mother remembered uh, when she was living, remembered having seen that routine of his when she was pretty young. Mm -hmm. And then he was still doing it when I was fairly young. So, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, that's a yeah uh, bit of a digression, but. Well, we've, we've wandered far afield, as true philosophers uh, tend to do. <laughs> Started well, I mean, off talking I, I, about the bookshop. Of, a number of these uh, these uh, bookstore interviews turned out to be about more than just the bookstore. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's fine with me. Um, uh, the uh, And probably, uh, you know, probably some of the future episodes will, you know, will be with sort of more normal bookstores. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, and um, well, I'm proud to be one of the abnormal ones. <laughs> yeah, the last one I did was with Look Books, L H O O Q, uh -huh. up, which is formerly in Carlsbad and went up to Astoria, but it may be coming back. And that was also sort of a very unique and unusual bookstore. And yeah, you know, lots of different things. Um, but I also I'm also planning to do do just normal indie bookstores uh, mm -hmm. as well. And those those interviews will probably be shorter. And, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe less interesting, although still, I think, interesting as a guide to uh, you know, the San Diego bookstore scene, because I, I started this program because, as I mentioned, I'm a displaced San Diegan. And, yeah. And so I sometimes watch San Diego travel videos and see them talking about these restaurants and beaches and parks mm -hmm. and shopping malls and so forth and all good things, but they never talk about bookstores. And yeah. I, I don't think people associate San Diego with bookstores. They think it's all you know, beach life and yeah, right. experience at a lot of interesting bookstores, although I'm finding out some really interesting ones I didn't know about, like yours. Uh, <laughs> uh, yours is ones I wouldn't have just found casually by uh, right. wandering around. But um, uh, uh, but anyway, um, uh, you know, I'm really glad to um, get a chance to, to find out about yours and about you. Yeah, it was great chatting. Um, I'm gonna have to check out some of your the the stuff you have for your students. Yeah, I will. Um, I will save the, the relevant link. I I need to update the um, the website first. It's a uh, for, for one thing. I originally made the website all one page, which makes it takes a, it mm -hmm. with all the videos on it. It takes forever to load, so I'm gonna have to break it into <laughs> separate ones for um, yeah. for this class. But um, but anyway, once once I have it ready, I'll. I'll send you the link and you can uh, take a look and- Yeah, definitely. Well, anyway, so thanks a lot. Uh, any any last thoughts? Yeah, thank you. No, just um, thanks for, for doing this. I think this is a cool um, way to, to sort of connect number one, but also to just highlight some, some things that people are doing as you were saying in those, the hidden corners of San Diego that you know, it's not it's not necessarily the beach scene, um, although we like to read our books on the beach. <laughs> um, but it's uh, there. There are some really interesting um, bookshops. Read on the beach. Uh, in the San Diego. on the beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cheerful beach read. <laughs> Say that again. A cheerful beach read. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, and it was great to meet you. Good to talk. Good to talk books. Good to talk philosophy. And I hope that we keep in touch. I will. I'll send you some info and we will definitely keep in touch. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So that's my interview with Jeff Mazzacci of the Eternal Return Bookshop, in San Diego. Uh, if uh, you want to see more of this kind of thing, then like, share, subscribe all that good stuff. Um, and I'll see you next time.